Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 104 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. I'm joined by Fred Burton. Fred is the former Deputy Chief of the Counterterrorism and Protective Intelligence Division for the U.S. State Department's Diplomatic Security Service and is currently the Executive Director of the Ontic Center for Protective Intelligence. He's also the author of four nonfiction books about counterterrorism and intelligence matters. I invited Fred onto the podcast today to talk about his book, Beirut Rules, The Murder of a CIA Station Chief in Hezbollah's War Against America. It's the story of William F. Buckley, a CIA officer and Special Forces veteran who was kidnapped and murdered in Lebanon in the 1980s, and the repercussions of that event on the Central Intelligence Agency and U.S. policy towards Lebanon as a whole. But before we dive into this story, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on Patreon, including Robert T. and Cole M. Your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Fred, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. It's my pleasure, Justin. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad to have you back. And believe it or not, even after more than 100 episodes of this podcast, I haven't really discussed any of the events in Beirut in the 1980s at all until now. So I'm really glad for the opportunity to talk about it with you today. Why, thank you. So can you tell me, to begin with, what is it that drew you to this story in the first place? Well, Justin, in the 1980s, I was a counterterrorism agent with the State Department, and part of my portfolio was the American hostages kidnapped in Lebanon and held captive by the Islamic Jihad organization. Our primary concern was obviously the kidnapping of Bill Buckley at the time when he was abducted. He was the station chief in Beirut. So our efforts focused on finding Bill Buckley. We kind of figured if we found Bill Buckley, we could find all the other hostages. And it Hmm. was the kind of case, Justin, that stayed with me for many, many years. And I always figured that it was a story that needed to be told simply because of the heroism of Bill Buckley for his entire career, which very few people knew about. And quite frankly, even when I was working the case as an agent, I I really did not understand all of his past and so forth. Like, like many of us during that time period, we were just caught up with the chaos of, of the 1980s with bombings and hijackings and so forth. I'll bet it seems like looking back, it was just a terribly chaotic time, even more so than now, is is how I kind of saw it, particularly in Lebanon. So did you have cause to travel to Lebanon? Did you spend any time there during that era? Or were you working on this case from stateside or from Germany or something like that? Well, we had a task force set up at the CIA at headquarters called the Hostage Location Task Force or the HLTF. And it was a interagency task force made up of State Department, CIA, at FBI, a small group of us. And what we would do, would we would meet and prioritize leads coming in as to proximity and locations. And then we would vet source reports from all over the world, but predominantly the Middle, the middle East. And if they necessitated meeting with human sources, obviously we traveled to those locations to do so. Beirut 
you know, during the mid 1980s was in, in many ways an area that was extraordinarily difficult to operate in just because of the kidnappings of the Americans. And therefore, there wasn't a lot of operational activity that was actually taking place outside of the U.S. Embassy proper. And that was predicated, Justin, on obviously the kidnappings of the Americans, the the missing station chief, and then, of course, the horrific Marine Corps barracks bombing and the U.S. Embassy bombings in 83 and 84. So we had a very limited footprint in Beirut due to that fact and numbers and our operational capabilities on the ground there during that time period was extraordinarily limited. Hmm. Okay. I can imagine. Yeah. They don't want to put more people at risk unnecessarily if so many are getting kidnapped or killed and what have you. So let's talk about Bill Buckley a little bit then. What was his career like leading up to him being picked as the chief of station for Beirut? Yeah, that's a great question. Bill was born in 1928 in Massachusetts, and he would have been 13 when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And his sister, Maureen, actually told me that they would sit around and, of course, listen to the radio. And Bill was fascinated with U.S. Army soldiers during that time period. And, of course, everybody had their ears glued to the war. And As soon as Bill graduated from Stoneham High School in Massachusetts, he enlisted in the U.S. Army, and he was was shipped off to Korea during the Korean War with the 1st Cav. While in Korea, Justin, he was a recipient of a Silver Star for rushing a machine gun Mm -hmm. nest. And let me pause here. I, I literally had no idea of this when I was working his case. That just showed you how chaotic that time period was. We were looking for a hostage, but we really knew very little, or at least I did, of his back background. Well, after Korea, he goes back to the States, goes to college at Boston University on the GI Bill. And interesting enough, he actually worked a, a side hustle for the legendary lawyer F. Lee Bailey during that time period that we learned, really? yeah, in putting together the book. And he joined a U.S. Army Special Forces detachment in about 1960, and he ended up being one of Kennedy's first Green Berets in Vietnam in 65. There he gets hooked up with the CIA, so most of his time frame in Vietnam was in paramilitary operations with the CIA as a Green Beret where he was a recipient of his second Silver Star for heroism while in Vietnam. And then after Vietnam, Bill stayed in the paramilitary space at the CIA and literally bounced around the world at various hotspots. Interesting enough, or as ironic as it might be, his specialty was training of hostage rescue teams. And You know, to me, that's so ironic that, you know, here was the man that was sent into Lebanon to help with the hostage problem, ended up being a hostage himself. Yeah, that's a horrible sort of irony there for sure. He sounds like an incredible man of action. It's hard to imagine some of the things that he must have seen and done, you know, because we obviously know about a certain level of it, but I'm going to imagine a lot of it is still classified and still under wraps if he's bouncing all over the world as a paramilitary for so much time. He must have seen and done some amazing things. Well, I approached the CIA and asked for their help in putting this story together and, you know, of course, reminded them that I had worked there and that I'd worked on Bill's case and that I thought it was a very important story that needed to be told. And they were very helpful and very receptive and declassified a lot of his records and then did some introductions for me for some of the station personnel that were there in Beirut at the time during his abduction. And then I went to his family. And at the time, he had a a girlfriend that was still living. She has since passed his way since the since she has since passed away since the book has been written. But she was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then Bill's sister, they were very protective early on until they realized that I just wanted to tell a positive story about the heroism of their loved one and brother. And 
it really helped significantly, Justin, because the family turned over like old school photographs, Polaroid pictures with handwritten notes from Bill on the back of them. And you could literally like trace his movements inside of Vietnam at the time. So Hmm. it was just, you know, my goal in telling his story was to shine a light on a man who was always running towards danger, like so many of our heroes in the military and in the intelligence community that in many ways suffer in silence. And and Bill was a star on the honor wall at, at Langley. And my goal was to let people know what kind of man this was who literally served his nation his entire life and was always running towards danger. And one other point about this that is really significant, in in 1983, when the first U.S. embassy bombing happened, and it was really the CIA's 9-11, it was the largest single loss of life for the CIA in any given terrorist attack at the time, Bill volunteered to go to Beirut to stand up the intelligence operations for the CIA after this horrific bombing. And he was there when the U.S. Marine Corps bombing took place where, you know, of course, there were 220 Marines and 18 Navy corpsmen that were killed. And then he was in captivity when the second embassy bombing took place. My gosh, it's amazing to think that he is the type of guy who runs towards that level of danger and, and has a wherewithal to be able to stand up something in the, the aftermath of those kind of events and, and during those events as well, like you said, since they were an, it was an ongoing situation. But it certainly sounds like he was exactly the right man for the job if anybody was going to go in there and kind of pick things back up after the tremendous losses that they had suffered. No doubt. And, you know, I never met the man. I certainly hunted for him while he was in captivity. And I mean... Pause for a moment and think, and I want the listeners to kind of reflect on that. Think about our world today if, and and after Benghazi, which I also wrote a book about, but think about our current events and if a CIA station chief anywhere in the world disappears and literally no one knows where he is on the heels of these horrific embassy bombings loss of life from the U.S. Marine Corps, hijackings, assassinations, the list just went on and on and on. So you can only imagine the 24 by 7 news cycle and social media cycle today if a CIA station chief is kidnapped anywhere in the world. Oh, certainly, certainly. It's it's hard to imagine a larger news story out there once that breaks. And I have to ask, so what were his priorities, would you say, when he arrived? Are you aware of that? Like he was having to start, I wouldn't say quite with a clean slate, but he was having to build up from basically nothing, wasn't he? Was it like staffing additional American personnel? Was he having to build a source network first or some other immediate priority as soon as he hit the ground? Yeah, his first priority was to stand up the station because the first station in Beirut or the existing station had all been killed in the 83 bombing. So all of those Mm -hmm. networks, all of those operations were shut down. So Bill's job was a startup operation. So he had to immediately start developing new sources. He had to reach out through liaison contacts with Lebanese intelligence service, the French, the British. Obviously, Beirut in this time period was like Casablanca during World War II. It was the center of espionage activity. It was also a center of gravity for terrorism operations. All of it was being driven out of Beirut. And of course, you had all of these players there, the Israeli Mossad, you had the Iranians operating. So it was just a nest of spies and bills like inserted into this environment to try to make sense of this emerging threat that literally had taken the U.S. intelligence community by surprise. We had suffered horrific losses, and no one knew how to get their handle around this phenomenon called terrorism. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, he certainly had his work cut out for him. And did he arrive, just help refresh my memory, did he essentially arrive 
alone, like unaccompanied? Was he a one man show to begin with, or did he have a, a skeleton crew with him? Something he had like a that? skeleton crew. The station was small. I should know those numbers off the top of my head. I just forgot, but there was only a handful of personnel that went in with him initially to restart operations because in the 83 bombing, the station was wiped out. And so you had new personnel Mm -hmm. that are being sent into this war-torn environment on the heels of this catastrophic attack. So, you know, Bill had to restart operations. And, you know, as you can only imagine in that kind of environment, how difficult that must have been. Yeah, I can I can barely imagine, honestly, because for one thing, I have to wonder how many people would be as willing to volunteer and to go as him when the entire previous team had been killed in that bombing. I mean, that's a that's a really tough sell for a lot of people, honestly. So finding the exact right people and people that have the abilities that you need and that want to be there, that probably had to be a little bit difficult as well. Yeah. And to make matters worse for us, Justin, it took a while for the light bulb to go off in my head on this, but you know, one of our extraordinarily difficult challenges while working the problem in the 80s was we, we literally lacked human intelligence to, to tell us where the hostages were. We did not even know for a long period of time who the hostage holders were. We thought there was an Iranian connection, but it was speculation. We had no smoking gun, per se, for a long period of time. And we literally were looking for a needle in a haystack. And because of the 1983 attack by the Islamic Jihad organization, who ultimately kidnapped Bill Buckley, they literally took out the eyes and ears of the station. So if, if you can sequence this, you have the 83 attack, it wipes out all of our human intelligence capabilities. Then you have the station chief kidnapped. That's further chaos for for us. You start pulling your people out. You don't have human sources. So who do you go to look for for help in those moments? And you don't have any sources to reach out to. So mm-hmm. we we literally lacked human intelligence to be able to help us on any given day. And so we were extraordinarily challenged with just trying to figure out basic information in a non-internet world, non-cell phones, it was just very, very problematic and and so forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's tough for me to imagine, but I'd, like, where do you even begin there? So can you tell me a little bit more about Islamic Jihad? Because they sound extremely capable from what I'm hearing already, at least during that era. era. Yeah, it's a great question. We had this group called Islamic Jihad, and I can remember getting their communiques in after they would carry out a terrorist attack or after they would kidnap a hostage. And of course, they were in Arabic. They were usually distributed through a couple of the local Lebanese papers in in hard copy. We would get a physical copy sent to us back in Washington via the diplomatic pouch after getting one secure fax to us during that time period. Back in those days, we had secure faxes, and we would treat it as physical evidence. So we would run the original communiques through all the forensics that you can imagine, and then we would conduct a fair amount of, at the time, called psycholinguistic analysis to try to determine who were these people. Was the writer of this communique Western educated? Were they English speakers? Because we simply did not know. And, you know, we literally had whiteboards with Islamic Jihad written on them with no idea what to put under that flowchart. And we kind of figured there was a Hezbollah nexus. So over time, we were able to piece together the puzzle to determine that the Islamic Jihad organization was really Hezbollah, who was really being choreographed and controlled by the Iranians, specifically the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. So we were able to do some link analysis and draw some personalities out within Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad. And, you know, all fingers pointed to this infamous master terrorist and bomber, 
by the name of Imad Mognia, who was ultimately, you know, the terrorist that was responsible for the embassy bombings in 83 and 84, the hijackings, the hostage takings, and, and so forth. So, but I can tell you that it wasn't very clear to us. I, you know, for months we would sit around at our hostage location task force with, you know, the best minds in Washington that you could assemble on this problem and speculate without any direct evidence as to who this group really was. Hmm. My gosh, what a challenging environment that was. I can't remember. It's yeah, it's just, it's just blowing my mind, honestly. So at what point did they decide that they were going to focus on Bill as an individual? Do you have any idea when that might have been? We think pretty early on when he first arrived, Bill was actually kidnapped March 16th, 1984. At the time, he was 55 years old. He had been in the country a few months. He lived off compound because he felt that he needed to get out and about by himself. In those days, Justin, there was no such thing as a CIA security team that provided protection for chiefs of station. Bill's kidnapping kind of changed that. You know, tragedy forces change, as we all know, in the government. Right. After Bill's kidnapping, that that changed and forced protection for people like Bill. But to the best of our knowledge, Bill was under local surveillance off compound. We don't know exactly for how long there was an incident where he may have been followed a couple weeks before his abduction. We don't think that he was aware of any surveillance. Let's put it this way. He never reported any surveillances. In, hmm. in my discussions with CIA station personnel in putting the book together, they did not report any suspicious activity. But, you know, I, I, I can remember in one conversation where one of the CIA guys told me, well, you know, you know, on any given day, we knew that things could, could happen. Things could go bad. This was a war zone. Every day was just a dangerous day. But if Bill saw surveillance, he never reported it. And then that morning when he was abducted, he came out of his flat, got into his Peugeot, which he didn't like. He thought it was too slow. And he actually, he had another vehicle on order that was coming in, which he never got. But he was blocked in after he got in his vehicle and Hezbollah overwhelmed him with numbers and threw him in the back of a Mercedes and sped off. And so, you know, there's certain aspects of that, that after all these years, I'm convinced we'll never know the answer to. For me, for someone like me who had spent a lifetime dissecting these terrorist attacks, I'd, I'd love to know exactly how they conducted their surveillance, You know, the methodology behind it. Was it foot, vehicular, technical? In all probability, it was a combination of foot and mobile surveillance they had on him. Because you know it was the kind of operating environment that a 55-year-old white guy in a suit would stick out, wouldn't be difficult, wouldn't be difficult mm-hmm. to follow. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see that. There's I have to wonder, and this is just speculation, you know, but I have to wonder if, you know, he he marked the surveillance because he sounds like an extremely savvy guy. He's obviously spent a lot of time in dangerous parts of the world, but there's really nothing that he could do about it. Like there's not any counter surveillance asset he could call on. There's no other personnel hardly. He's just on his own there, like you said, no security detachment or anything. So what, what good would it do to report it? You know, what's, what's the, what is that going to change for him in a sense? He's still got a job to do and he's still practically the only person there. Yeah. We looked at that in Nexus to, I believe it was in 1975 with the assassination of Richard Welch in Athens. That was the previous CIA station chief. And, you know, November 17 shot and killed Welch at home. If memory serves me right. And they grabbed Bill as he was departing his residence, as, as you know, in this business, you know, if you're looking to find somebody, where are you going to go? You're primarily going to go to their house or you're going to go to their place of work. Bill was a man who had survived two wars. I, I'm not saying he was jaded or, or downplayed the risk. I think he knew exactly the operating environment he was in, which was a nest of worms. I'm not going to second guess the man. I know that we had a lot of discussions about that and the agency took some hits about, well, you know, how could this happen? 
you know, at the end of the day, Justin, especially in, in 1984, when Bill was kidnapping, when Bill was kidnapped, this was a dangerous place. And Bill knew exactly what he was volunteering for. The threat was at, at above high. It was at a critical threat level. Every day, you're under attack, whether you realize it or not. Your digital devices contain your entire life, your finances, your conversations with friends and family, your interests, and even your movements. And all of that is vulnerable to an ever-expanding class of criminals, scam artists, hackers, and even governments. You don't want to leave your data security entirely in the hands of your ISP, or anyone else for that matter. It's up to you to protect yourself using a multi-layered defense strategy. Silent offers you the protection you need to keep your data and devices secure from wireless threats. Their multi-shield technology blocks cellular signals, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, EMP, RFID, NFC, and more. Silent's lineup includes everything from signal blocking wallets all the way up to 40 cubic liter Faraday duffel bags. When you're geared up with Silent, you'll be truly disconnected, undetectable, untraceable, and unhackable. And you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order from Silent. Find them at slnt.com. That's slnt.com. I'm not saying that mistakes weren't made by a lot of people. But, you know, at the end of the day, he deserved better. One of the things and one of the motivations for me wanting to tell this story, and I told the agency this when I first approached them, Justin, was, you know, I, I, I still harbor a lot of guilt that we really should have done more in, in trying to find him. And I know we did everything we possibly could during that period of time. You know, but at the end of the day, we were the United States of America, and we should have moved heaven and earth to try to find him. And I'm, I'm not saying we mm-hmm. didn't try. We, we certainly used every national level asset you can imagine. There just wasn't a lot of capabilities. We, we didn't control the geography. You know, you didn't have the technology that exists today. We yeah. lacked the human yeah, intelligence yeah. to be able to help us. It was just a mess. Yeah, unfortunate. So unfortunate. So why do you think that he was kidnapped as opposed to simply being killed? Was the objective to get some other political prisoners freed or a ransom or the intelligence value or a combination of all of that? Maybe The political theater of hostage taking, Bill was kidnapped. And of course, we started getting Islamic Jihad communiques. And then we had proof of life pictures that would show up with Bill in captivity. I mean, we learned a lot at the hostage location task force about the forensics of doing these kinds of investigations remotely, you know, dissecting the pictures, trying to figure out during some of the audio tapes that we received of the hostages reading communiques of breaking that down from an audio perspective to try to pick up background noises. And, you know, the forensics of, of, of hostage tapes, really, we got quite good at that over a period of time, learning as we were going along to try to draw some nexus. But the political theater of, of here you had an asymmetric terrorist organization that was able to kidnap the world's most powerful intelligence chief and parade him in front of the cameras, the value alone. I remember sitting down at the CIA one day and someone mentioned that, you know, we had not seen this since, you know, like the Hanoi Hilton, where, you know, you had the mm-hmm. POWs from, from there being paraded in front of the world and literally America could do nothing about it. Right. So Mm -hmm. Bill was an extraordinarily high value target and a brilliant target in many ways. So, you know, I've, I've done a lot of these investigations and, you know, in Beirut, we had, we had had our ambassador assassinated in 76. We had an econ, econ officer also assassinated in 76, but, you know, the hostage taking of, of the CIA station chief was a huge deal for the terrorist group. And they were winning. We were losing badly to be blunt, Justin. Mm-hmm. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's hard to hear, but I mean the the evidence seems to bear it out there certainly. So, what happened to Bill once he was taken? Like, do we know the location that he was held, how he was treated, that sort of thing? Well, we painstakingly went through locations. Every time we had a hostage released, you know, we would go through, we would walk them through their last location, then go back to the beginning, try to piece together which hostages were held with who. We would go through locations and we got up to as many, as many as they could remember. I can, I can remember in one case, I don't remember exactly which hostage it was we debriefed, but, you know, we were up to like 25 different locations and oh, uh, they were being moved all around the southern suburbs of Beirut. They were going to the Sheikh Abdullah Barracks, which was an Iranian stronghold in the Bakaa Valley. At one point, we believe strongly that they were being held inside the Iranian embassy in Beirut in the basement. Hard to get a bigger smoking gun, right, than, than that. Yeah. The FBI had some intel at one point that Bill was actually flown to Tehran and maybe debriefed there by the Iranians and brought back to Beirut. We know he was interviewed by probably the IRGC, and he was always, you know, the Americans and the hostages were held together, like in a flat, in a Hezbollah-controlled neighborhood, chained to radiators. But Bill was always by himself, like in a closet or in another room. And all the hostages were beaten and tortured uh, to some degree. And Bill obviously, you know, suffered the worst of any of them. So, and, and as you can imagine from an intelligence perspective, you know, once Bill vanished on March 16th, 1984, everything shut down, right? You had, you had to shut down every mm-hmm. active intelligence network that you had. So, you know, on the heels of the embassy bombing, which killed all the station personnel, now you have the station chief kidnapping at a time when you needed every human asset that you possibly had. They all had to be shut down because the fear was that that Bill could have compromised them all. We we have no evidence. I was never we were never able to determine that because we just don't know the answer to that question. But we had to assume that that Bill was tortured to the point that he gave up everything that he would have known, which, you know, as, as you and I both know is, is a reasonable expectation. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And, and he was held for months, I know. So that is a lot of time to draw out information. Do you recall, like, were there efforts on the ground to find him? Did we have any like U S friendly militias looking for him or paramilitaries that were inserted at the time? Anything like that? We tried. Bill was held for 444 days. We, We work with the Brits, the French, the Lebanese, the Israelis. You know, they had their own can of worms with a missing hostage by the name, soldier by the name of Ron Arad. Everybody was looking for their own hostages. And Mm. we kind of collectively would pool ideas at times, but nobody really had any tactical intelligence whatsoever. And the operate, you know, the operating environment was, was too dangerous to insert you know, paramilitary kind of personnel. I want to believe that if we would have pinpointed a specific location, we could have gotten eyes on in some capacity, but we we never had the intelligence to even do that. So the big answer to that question is no, not really. We, we were never able to get people into areas that we could say with a high degree of certainty that he was there. Okay. I see. Were there, was there, I have to assume there were like rescue plans kind of on the shelf, ready to go. If you found a location, anything like that, like was Delta force or somebody like that willing to go in, they just needed a location or was it, you know, more of an intent to like try to negotiate his release or pay ransom? Or well, we like tried that? every angle you can imagine. And yes, we certainly had meetings with JSOC and those were discussions that we had. I do believe that the white house would have green, greenlit any operation to rescue Bill in the event that we could find him. And that's a fail on our part, you know, that we own that. We could not locate him in order for them to even lean forward. But to answer your question, yes, there was always that. You know, we 
we learned through our hostage debriefings after we started talking to all the Americans that came out and we would get access to the other foreign hostages. I, I can remember talking to a British hostage and an Irish hostage and, you know, the hostages were moved after one was released. And sometimes they would go like, for example, to, you know, from a high rise flat in the Southern suburbs of Beirut, which was Hezbollah country. There's no way we're going to get in and out of there to a rural farmhouse where they were hidden under a barn. So hmm. because the hostages could remember cows and, and chickens and, and so forth. So once a hostage were released, we knew we lost a window of opportunity. One hostage, this is an interesting sidebar story. He's still a good friend of mine was Charlie Glass. Charlie was an ABC news correspondent in Beirut at the time of his abduction. Very good friends with Peter Jennings, who used to host the old nightly news for ABC. Yeah, when yeah. Charlie exca- Charlie was kidnapped by Hezbollah, taken to a location, he actually escaped and had the wherewithal to make his way to a Syrian checkpoint and actually spoke to a Syrian general and said, look, I'll take you back exactly to where I was located if you want to go in and arrest or, or kill the bad guys. And the Syrians refused. So, hmm. you know, we always suspected that, you know, the Syrian intelligence service knew more than they would ever tell us. The Lebanese G2, we believed, always knew more. You know, certainly the Russian KGB, we thought, knew more. But there was absolutely no way we we're going to get anything of value from any of those services. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly not. Man, that's unfortunate. And meanwhile, you know, Bill and the other hostages are just suffering every day, every hour with hardly any real way to get any kind of assistance to them. Yeah. It, one of the things I learned in putting together the book, you know, Bill Bill Buckley had a very good friend in Vietnam named Tucker Guggenheim, who was kind of a legendary CIA figure in himself, you know, special forces guy, one of these guys that stayed on and, and fought in the jungles there in Nam. And he ended up hostage in Vietnam, and Bill did his best to try to find him and get him out of captivity, but but failed. And one of big Bill's biggest fears was getting taken hostage and dying in captivity alone. And oh, um, I think about that a lot. That you know, that that's exactly how he died. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you or how did the world learn of his death anyway? Was it through one of those communiques you mentioned? Well, in the course of our debriefings of the hostages that came out, the Americans, Father Martin Jinko, who was a wonderful man, a Catholic priest, David Jacobson, who was the hospital administrator at the American University in Beirut. Both of them told us that, you know, Bill had been sick for a long period of time, had was coughing, was delirious, was crying out in the middle of the night. And they had begged the guards to get him some medical care, to try to bring in a doctor or to give him some medicine. And the guards refused. And one night, Bill was just coughing nonstop. And this went on for quite some time. And then the coughing just stopped. And the hostages could hear the scurrying of feet and, you know, muffled tones of like guards talking to each other. And then they, and I'll I'll never forget this, Justin, it was David Jacobson. He takes, he takes, we're we're at the hostage debriefing location site at the U.S. Air Force Medical Facility in Wiesbaden, Germany. And the Air Force took extraordinarily good care of us there and as well as the hostages. And David said, you know, I, I know Bill died and there was three of us interviewing the hostage, and I, I said, "Well, well, David, how do you know?" And he takes his he takes his hand, and he hits the table like this, and he keeps doing it, and we're all like sitting in this room. Every time he slapped the table, we're just like jumping back, and David starts crying, and he said. That was Bill's head hitting the stairs as they were dragging him down the steps. 
Oh my gosh. And, you know, literally there wasn't a dry eye in the room at that moment, as you can imagine. And, you know, we took a break and I went back, we had a secure voice phone set up in, in a command post there. And I called back to Washington and I said, you know, David Jacobson said that Bill's dead. And, you know, of course, Washington didn't want to believe it. Well, you know, did they see it? Did, did he see the body? And it's like, no, but, you know, you're trying to explain to Washington, you know, you know what I mean? You're trying to explain the circumstances. There's no doubt in our mind that, that this had happened. Mm-hmm. And, and there was just this huge sense of failure on our part. I, I just remember that day thinking, you know, maybe he was just sick and maybe they did take him to the hospital. And, and then once the other hostages starting to corroborate the same story, we knew that in all probability, Bill had died. And we put his death on or about June 3rd, 1985. And, and Bill had been held for 444 days at that point. And so it took us a while to recover his body, which we eventually did. But yeah. Man. Yeah, it was, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it was actually like several years later, wasn't it? Before his remains were Yeah, recovered? we had a, a symbolic tombstone put up at Arlington National Cemetery in 1988, three years after he died. But we did not recover his body until December of 1991. So he died in 85. Hmm. We recovered his body in 91. We basically got a report. The The U.S. Embassy in Beirut got a report that there was a body in a, in a blanket along the side of the road. And the embassy security officer responded over. I, I cover that a lot in, in Beirut rules. And we also recovered Lieutenant Colonel Rich Higgins's body, who was a, a Marine officer that had been kidnapped and and hung and murdered by Hezbollah during that same window of time. So both of them were flown back to Dover. Bill is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Well, yeah, it's it's very sad to think about everything that he had seen and done and then everything that he suffered during that that time in captivity. And he ends up, at least temporarily, he ends up just, you know, covered with a blanket on the side of a road and, and a phone call is made or, or whatever. So it's, that's a very ignominious end there, unfortunately to a, you know, pretty incredible life by incredible, pretty incredible guy there. It's very sad. Yeah. It was extraordinarily sad when you go back and look at, you know, the history of the man who had, you know, a highly decorated soldier who only wanted to serve his country and served honorably with heroism and, in two hot wars and, you know, were silver star recipients at both and had lived all over the world in these various hot spots. He was, you know, he was kind of like a global smoke jumper, you know, always running towards danger and, mm, yeah. and ending up in this place where nobody really wanted to be after the eyes and ears of America were wiped out. And, you know, I can only imagine what was running through his head during that time period. And it's, it's just a shame. And you look at that time period, Justin, from a historical perspective, and I, I write a lot about it. And you just timeline out all these terrorist attacks in the 80s. And, you know, obviously, the world changed on, on 9-11. But in the 80s, if you looked at the tempo of attacks, and catastrophic attacks against US and American interests around the globe, predominantly in Lebanon, to be blunt, and Kuwait to a lesser degree, the terrorists were winning and we were losing badly. That was the operating environment that men like Bill Buckley and others you know, were sent into to try to figure out what is this war that has been declared on America? You know, Up until that point, we were fighting the Cold War, right? Our whole intelligence apparatus was centered on doing battle you know, with the Soviet Union, the covert operations are underway in Afghanistan, you know, to battle the Soviet war machine. And here we had this asymmetric group being controlled ultimately by a nation state, Iran. And, you know, they were winning and we were losing badly. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough pill to swallow. No doubt about it. So Fred, what happened in the end to the, the, the hostage takers, what happened to the people that took him from Hezbollah and, and Islamic Jihad? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, my office, one of my other responsibilities was our unit ran the Rewards for Justice program, which was the $20 million program for bin Laden. And it's an extraordinarily successful program on from a counterterrorism perspective. And, you know, we started offering rewards for all of these terrorists that were involved in Bill Buckley's kidnapping, the embassy bombings, the hijackings. And, you know, there's there's three primary suspects that, you know, we identified that were involved in all of these events to include Bill Buckley's kidnapping. And that was Emad Mognia, Ali Atwa, and Hassan Izzeldin. And Ali Atwa died of cancer, as best I can figure out, a few years ago. He was never brought to justice for any of these attacks. Hassan Izzeldin, to the best of my knowledge, has never been killed or captured. He's still out there running around somewhere. But in 2008, the master terrorist that was behind, or the operational commander, however you want to describe him, the the Ramsey Yosef of the operation, Imad Mugnia, was assassinated in Damascus, Syria, in an operation that no one has ever claimed credit for officially. We talk a great deal about that in the book as to who are the most likely people behind that operation. And obviously it doesn't take a a genius to figure that out. It would be either us or the Israelis or a combination thereof. So he ultimately suffered some form of justice or vengeance, however you want to describe it. The, The hostage guards... To be honest, we never were able to identify, we never got enough identifiers to ever identify them. The original kidnapping team or teams that that kidnapped most of the Americans, we we really never were able to to paint them in any capacity other than the big three. So one's dead by the hands of who knows who. Another one died of natural causes and one is still out there. My gosh. Well, if it was either the Americans, us, or the Israelis, both are countries with very long institutional memories for this kind of thing, particularly the Israelis, I think. So um, I'm sure that he has not had a good night's sleep since that time, I would imagine. And Mugnia, since you mentioned, it sounds like his death was much quicker than Bill Buckley's was. Yeah, that's for sure. You can look at the details surrounding that case. It was a a brilliant counterterrorism operation to not only follow him in a hostile operating environment in a place like Damascus and to get an IED close to him, make sure that it functioned properly and to take him out. You know, I, I, Mm -hmm. I've thought long and hard about that. I don't know the answer to this question, Justin, is it vengeance or is it justice? Is justice served in that manner? You know, I don't know the older I get. All I know is I'm glad to see that someone hunted him down and that he paid for all the loss of American life that and all the blood that was on his hands. Right, right. Yeah, there's there's an interesting question there. And, you know, it's I certainly would not say, oh, well, you know, we just want to forget and move on, you know, how Bill was treated and how he died and all that. But also we're kind of perpetuating a cycle pretty much endless cycle of violence in that region that is, you know, there's, there's no end in sight, like I said. So it, it's hard to say where all of that will come to its conclusion, but probably many, many years in the future, to say the least. Yeah, for sure. I, I do know that if you look back through, as a student of terrorism history, you look over the, the Wrath of God squads, which I've written a lot about, the Israeli teams that were put together after the massacre in Munich. They were the first ones that went out to hunt down those responsible for the killings of the 11 Olympic athletes in Munich. By the way, one of them was also an American. He was a dual national. And we kind of took a play out of that playbook to to hunt down some of these terrorists from a renditions perspective or a, a targeted assassination perspective. But Magnia eventually grew to legendary status inside of the Hezbollah security organization and certainly was a primary player 
you know, in an operational environment with the Iranians. So, you know, but at the end of the day, I, I, I literally, there's not a week that goes by that I don't think about that time frame, Justin, and, and think about how murky and blind we were when all these attacks were taking place and our inability to forecast these attacks, not to mention the significant physical security measures that we would subsequently have to put into place. So, you know, we learned a lot of hard lessons from the 80s and, you know, we've made our embassies a lot stronger and CIA station chiefs today are are so much better protected because of the tragedies that suffered men like Bill Buckley and Richard Welch in Athens. And so, but, you know, I think that's how governments are, right? We we are the kind of country that tragedy forces these kinds of changes. And sometimes it takes the strategic attacks for us to, to move forward and, and to change, you know, institutional bureaucracy. Yeah, certainly, certainly a shock to the system certainly creates big changes at times. There's no question about that. Wow. Well, okay. Well, thank you, Fred. This has been such a fascinating talk, and it's a really sad and and tragic tale there, unfortunately, about what happened to Bill. But, you know, he's got his star on the the wall of honor now, and he's got a grave at Arlington. And that's a sad end to his story, you know, but he is still remembered by you and by your readers and by a lot of people in the organizations that he served in. So that's a, a pretty good legacy to have, I think, in the end. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, none of my books have a good ending, I'm, I'm sad to say, <laughs> but I, I do think it's important for us to never forget. In many ways, I'm, I'm optimistic that Beirut rules would, would inspire others to want to serve, join the agency, serve their country. Let's do a better job than what we were able to do in the 80s. Yeah, certainly. There's always lessons to be learned from the past like that. And it's important to remember those and carry them forward as well. Well, thank you for your time, Fred. I really appreciate it. For those of you who want to pick up the book, we definitely have not covered the entirety of this book by any stretch of the imagination. There's a lot of stuff, especially about the larger picture in Lebanon at the time that you might find very interesting. So the book is called Beirut Rules by Fred Burton, the murder of a CIA station chief and Hezbollah's war against America. And I I highly recommend it. Pick it up as soon as you're able, because it's a very, very enlightening read. And thank you for your time, Fred. I really appreciate it. It was good talking to you again. For those of you who haven't already heard it, Fred was my previous guest on episode 15 when we discussed one of his other books called Chasing Ghosts about the murder of Joseph Alon, an Israeli military officer who was killed here in the United States while he was stationed in the Washington, D.C. area. And there were some international repercussions to that story as well. So that is a very good interview and a very good big book to pick up, pick up as well. Thank you, Justin. Well, thanks. For your time. All right. I appreciate it. You take care. Thank you. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer, this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.